Lord, be with Martin. Encourage him with your Holy Spirit and make his inspiration shine through and encourage us all. Amen. Amen. The fire, charcoal, had been warm. His belly was full. The taste of fish lingered in his mouth and his moustache clung to a crusty bit of bread. They'd been fishing. They'd landed a big catch, 153 fish, one for every nation of the known world. Friends around him, he should have been happy, he wasn't. His best friend was there as well, the one who died and came back to life. And Peter remembered it all too well. His best friend Jesus, Peter had abandoned and denied him when he was arrested. And there'd been a fire there at that moment. And Jesus had been arrested and Peter had followed from a distance, keeping in the shadows. It was a servant girl who spotted him first. This man was with Jesus too. Arrest him as well. Peter had gone tight and his heart had thumped. He was afraid. And that's why he blurted out, Woman, I don't know the man. A lie, of course. But before he could give himself an excuse, another one called out, Yes, you're right, I've seen him with Jesus too. You're one of his followers, aren't you? No, no, Peter shouted, wishing the earth would swallow him up. But the strangers wouldn't give up. Jesus had been so public, the miracle so amazing, the crowds huge, and Peter the brashest and noisiest of the bunch. Yes, definitely he's from Galilee, someone said. Listen to him, listen to his accent, a third one called. No, no, shouted Peter, heart racing, forehead sweating. I never knew the man. And a cock crowed, just as Jesus said it would. As Jesus said it would, when Peter had been boasting about how he would fight to the death for him, how he would love him more than the others. No, Peter, Jesus had whispered, before this night is out, before the cock crows, you will deny me. And so, when that cock crowed, Peter wept bitterly. The night was dark, and so was he. And that's why, a while later, this man with a full belly, warm feet and a good catch of fish was not happy. Jesus had risen. Jesus was alive. They'd seen him. They should have been rejoicing. He should have been happy. But he wasn't. He'd let Jesus down. There was no place for him. No one would want him. Least of all, Jesus. He thought he could be a rock, the centre of the community, better than the rest. But he was more like the sand on the beach. Washed around by every swish of culture. And then Jesus, by the lakeside, by the fire, with the smell of those 153 fish, some still cooking on the barbecue, turned to Peter and said, with a smile, I think, Simon, Simon, do you love me more than these? <laughs> yes, Lord, you know that I love you. A little bit hesitant there. Then feed my sheep. And the second time, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And Peter thinks he wants me back. He still wants me to be a fisher of men. He still thinks I can be a rock. Though I know I'm no better than the others. But he wants me to be a shepherd, to take care of the others. And he wants me back. And then a third time, three denials, three questions. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I do. Feed my sheep. But this time, Jesus uses a different word for love. One that isn't just sacrificial love, but friendship love. 
And Jesus does not just offer a new start. Jesus offers Peter a renewal of friendship. The friendship they shared for those three years before Jesus was crucified. Jesus had said, God, I make you my friends. Be my friend again. The fire was warm, his belly full. He was truly surrounded by friends. And now Peter was happy again, not only because his best friend was alive, but because something had come back to life in him. Jesus patiently waiting for the penny to drop, three times again calling him Peter, which means rock, three times commissioning him afresh, restoring the friendship, friendship with God. Jesus, always patient, always persevering, whose love never gives up. Jesus, truly the Emmanuel, as Matthew kept on saying. Peter stirs, he awakes. Peter has been daydreaming. We've been doing one of those irritating flashbacks, like you get on a serial on TV. All that had been years ago. The betrayal, two fires, the catch of fish, decades earlier. But Peter often pondered those memories of that encounter with Jesus, and it seemed like only yesterday. But everything he'd done in life that really counted had started there. And he picked up his quill, the quill that had been writing his letter. And he thought of the thousands who followed Jesus, scattered throughout the world with 153 nations. And he thought of them, the struggles they were going through, the ways they will have failed Jesus, just like he had. Those who thought they were strong but were not strong. Those who thought they were sure but doubted. Those who said things that they regretted and put their foot in it. Those who had denied Jesus when they'd been threatened with death. And he thought of, how can I help them? Those who had it tough. Those who'd lost jobs. Some who'd lost their livelihoods. It was hard going against the crowd, being called names and sneered at. And he remembered that special gift that Jesus gave him on that morning by the lakeside with that second fire and the 153 fish. And now that fire burned in his belly. The knowledge deep within that it all depends on God, on God's call, the gift of God, the friendship of Jesus, all there. God with us, Emmanuel. Peter thinks, I really must get Matthew to write a gospel about this. The secret of everything. From those who in the church were busy inventing PAH, the Christians were known for visiting the sick, to those who had changed their shopping habits because of their faith, to those whose business practice testified Christ and did things differently, to those like his friend Paul who were headline speakers telling others about Jesus, every one of them a rock, and so much of it going back to that lakeside. Peter knows that if you're going to do a single, single thing as a follower of Jesus, it's based there. It's based in that love of Jesus. It's based on the knowledge that though you let him down, you know Jesus calls you his friend. It's based on the knowledge that God gives you his Holy Spirit to equip you. Emmanuel, God with you. It's based on what we've just seen in baptism. The water poured out on Abigail, the gift of God's presence, the gift of God's spirit, though Abigail's a little worried about water at her young age, so we did have to use a little bit less than we'd like to. But it symbolises that gushing of water that is poured out. God's presence, God's love with you and me. And so Peter, thinking in his heart of all that has happened to him, 
of all that denial, of Jesus welcoming him again, of the gift of God's abundant love poured out on him, in which he has been baptised. He writes in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, Keep your love constant. Love covers a multitude of sins. And he just thinks of the constancy of Jesus' love and the constancy and the wonderful way in which Jesus' love had covered his sins, as it were. They had been washed away. Jesus had welcomed him back and changed his heart. And Peter thinks, yes, this has happened to me. This is what God has done for me. Now, guys, let us do this for others as well. Keep your love constant. And then he adds, be hospitable. Remembering Jesus' words, do you love me that third time? And that love, that word philia, with its focus on friendship and on community. And Peter says, this is what God does. He draws us into the community. And we delight after the service today that Dan and Sam have brought us Indian snacks so we can enjoy some food together after the service together. This is part of what it is to be part of God's community. And then Peter goes on and he says to himself, and I want to give St Paul's and St Mary's a text for the year, so I'm going to add this verse as well. Each one, as a good manager of God's different gifts, must use for the good of others the special gift he has received from God. Because Peter thinks of that special gift that he has received and he wants to encourage us all to use the gifts God has given us, not out of duty, not out of burden, not out of fear, but out of joy. Because Peter has discovered how generous God is. Peter has discovered God's patience. Peter has discovered that God picks us up a time and time again. And Peter thinks to himself, I'm not afraid to take risks. I don't want to bury my gold coins, my talent in the ground. God is not a harsh God. My God is an overflowing, generous God. I'm going to take the risk and I'm going to use the gifts that God has given to me. And I have been using the gifts. And what joy it is, though I fall, yet the Lord raises me up. As you shared earlier, you ask why, and then you begin to discover what God does in your life as you battle through and as you trust through. I'm no longer going to fear failure, he thinks. If I fail, God will pick me up. And then what a joy, he thinks. How else can I encourage him? What a joy, he thinks, that God invites me, Peter thinks, us, to step in beside Jesus, that Jesus' hands are my hands. God could have been all sufficient, but God humbles God's self. And Peter thinks, I've seen the joy of seeing my gifts multiply and grow and develop. And as I have served others, as I have used the gifts God has given me, so I have grown in myself. And I, who began, as it were, with 2,000 talents, have found 2,000 more talents, wave after wave of joyful, delightful learning and growing. It's worth it. And Peter thinks, I've been investing in eternity. I've been helping change the world for eternity. People discovering Jesus. People added to the kingdom. Abigail added to the kingdom. Peter beginning all this with Paul and so many others as well. Peter's life suddenly worth it in the ways that Christians are called into the world. In the midst of the dull, numbing routine of everyday life, the risen life coming and assuring and saying, follow me, and giving us his work to do, work that brings eternal fruit. Just think of the joy of sharing with someone else about Jesus. And what you share with them changes their life. And that fruit lasts for eternity, and you will spend eternity rejoicing in that fruit. Think of the joy of those early Christians who visited the sick. People didn't used to visit the sick, believe it or not. We do it because of people like Peter, 
And that flows on to PAH. What a joy for Peter when he sees all the nurses and doctors here. That's the fruit of his ministry and of others like him. What a joy for those who in their business life seek to represent and reflect the glory of the kingdom of God and change societies for eternity. What a joy when we use our gifts to build God's church. The first fruits of God's eternal kingdom. What a joy when we invest our gifts, when we take risks, when we grow in them and discover that as we do it, we are working with God. Today, you here who think that you are the last person Christ would come to, to be with words of forgiveness, patience and call. You think that you are the last person that Jesus would come to. But in Christ, the last are first. To you, who are so much like Peter, Jesus says, come, follow me, feed my sheep. sheep. And at the end of the age, Jesus will say, well done, come and share my happiness. Come and rejoice for eternity in the fruit of your life and in what I have done in you. Amen.